dismiss the kids church in just a minute. But first, let's dismiss Mr. Lee. Hold on, kids. Wait just a second. We gotta dismiss Mr. Lee first. Doesn't do any good to dismiss kids without him. Okay, Mr. Lee, are you ready? All right. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, let's uh, everybody walk down this road and head out this way. Everyone else, please open up to Matthew chapter 26. God is not an American. But He made one, and I'm thankful. Or made me one, I should say, and I'm thankful. And uh, if I got to do any choosing about it, I reckon I feel like most of the people in the world that I wish I were American. And so, it's a great privilege. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. By the way, don't buy into uh, theological trends. There's one right now that is that uh, it, it, it just stinks of rebellion and, and uh, anarchism, and that is uh, to be disloyal to the country that God made you a part of. The Bible has some very, very clear instruction in the New Testament for how we as believers are to uh, pray for those that are in authority over us and how we're to respond to those that are in authority over us and how we're to participate uh, with our government. I, I wonder uh, what anti-government anti Christians wonder what they think when they read the Apostle Paul and he is uh, being sent, uh, being uh, mistreated and as a Roman citizen. He uh, takes advantage of his rights as a Roman citizen and the way that he speaks and uh, the way he speaks to the governments and how that he responds to government. It also is surprising to me, you know, I, some people think, and it's because I think of a very, very narrow scope or perspective. They think, oh, Pastor, we just, we have... You know, such a corrupt government. We have such a uh, corrupt time that we live in, and just things have never been so terrible and so bad before. And my friend, uh, it's true that in so much as government has people involved in it, that it's that there are sinners in it, and it, and it's true. Anytime there are people, there's corruption, and there's no question about that at all. Like I said before, God is an American. He's not an American. Uh, God is the God of all living. But this country has been blessed by God, and anyone who's gone anywhere else could tell you so. They could tell you the tangible ways that God has blessed this nation and this country. And if you don't have gratitude uh, for that, it, the, the problem isn't with the country. The problem is with you. God's given us a wonderful land, a wonderful country. And uh, you know something? I want God to bless our country. I want to be a godly country. We need to preach the gospel in our nation, and we need to preach the gospel in all in all the places in our nation. And uh, certainly, we don't want to uh, become a theocracy. Uh, you can't make somebody a believer by legislating uh, principles or morality on people. But you could be a, a nation that the morality and the principles of the people are reflected in the government. So, what our government is is a reflection of what you are what I am. That's the sort of thing that bothers me the worst about leadership sometimes. I remember the uh, first time that I was shocked by an election. It was when Bill Clinton was re-elected. It was the most shocking election of my lifetime. I just, I didn't believe that a man who was so immoral and uh, that uh, was just so, I mean, they were just, he was, he was being impeached. And a man that was so wicked, I just couldn't believe that he got reelected. And I remember, yeah, I was a teenager, and I just remember being stunned that, I mean, I know he had a terrible uh, candidate that was running against him, but I was just stunned. I couldn't believe a guy like Bill Clinton, who was so immoral, such a wicked person, got reelected. And then it occurred to me uh, when I was asking someone who told me they voted for him, I said, how could you vote for him? I said, don't you know that this and this and this? They said, well, yeah, I know that. And I remember this man who was retired older gentleman, a friend of my grandfather's, a, a guy that I uh, really respected, really liked. And he went inside, and he came back out, and he had his, his stocks and a sheet that showed his stocks. And he said, Bill Clinton's been good for me financially, and that's why I voted for him. And uh, it just was a real reflection to me. I thought, wow, okay. So then I started thinking more about it, and I realized, you know what, the immorality, unfaithfulness, all these things, they actually are pretty reflective of who we are as a people. So you don't like your leaders, look in a mirror and ask yourself what's wrong with the people electing them in a nation like ours. And uh, that, that uh, ought to be uh, help for you. It's helped me a lot 
But anyway, I'm glad. I'm a, a grateful for the nation that we live in. And if you don't like it, I like you. But I wish you'd go somewhere else and look around a little bit because the reality of it is, is your attitude stinks. And it's tough to be around you uh, when you don't like our country. You don't like our country, you don't like me. That's the way I feel about it because I'm an American. God made me an American. And so it's personal just a little bit. And uh, so fix your attitude. Matthew chapter 26. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26. Uh, I've been looking forward to being in this portion of Scripture here this morning. And I, I want to just preach a message this morning. If you want a title for it, it's the DNA of a traitor. The DNA of a traitor, or the makeup of a traitor, if you will. And so we're going to look at uh, Judas Iscariot. Uh, a little more carefully this morning, he really is in Matthew 26 and chapter 27, one of the major players, major actors in this portion of the scripture. Verse 14 of Matthew chapter 26, the Bible says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I'll deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him, meaning Jesus. If you'll go over to uh, chapter 26 and verse 25, notice this statement by Judas this morning. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Speaking of the one that's going to betray him. He said unto him, Thou hast said. And uh, then if you go to chapter 27, and please look down with me to verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Father, as we look this morning at the DNA of a traitor, Lord, I pray that the things about Judas Iscariot uh, that are very apparent as we see his end, God, I pray that they would be revealed in us and that we would see how vitally important it is that God, we not pretend to be anything, but that we realize what we are as a result of what we've done with Jesus. And we pray in His name. Amen. Well, Judas Iscariot for me is an enigma, especially when I look at him. Uh, it isn't so much so anymore because we've just lost literacy in a lot of ways. Uh, for instance, if you were to go to the average high school today, and I actually asked the high schoolers at Shamir School, this in Bible Club, a few uh, weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, I asked them what the name Benedict Arnold meant to them. And they didn't know, actually. How many of y'all grew up, and if you were called a Benedict Arnold, that was like the very worst thing you could, anybody could say about you, right? And uh, you know, kids today aren't taught history. They're taught, um, it's tragic, actually. It ticks me off. If you're a parent, and you send your kids to public school, you need to do something different. Because the public school education teaches your kids to hate God, or that there is no God, and teaches them socialism, communism, and your public, the public school. And I, you say, Pastor, there's some really great teachers. I know. I know some really great teachers that are in the system. I'm not saying there's not good people. I think your kids are great kids. But I'm just telling you what's being taught there. And it's not a good education. But uh, they, teach, uh, they teach socialism. They teach there's no God. They teach your children that they're animals. And uh, they're, they are overtaking our society. We weren't able to overthrow our country uh, through strength and through might, so they've done it by just taking over our children and reprogramming them. And uh, friend, it's, it's tragic. I was looking in Anthony's history book uh, the other day. I, I can't read his history book, to be quite honest with you. It makes me lose my temper. And I want to go find the writers of it, and I want to go find the teachers in the school, and I want to have a talk with them. And I don't think it would uh, be really what God's called me to do for my ministry. And so, but, uh, you know, when I open up his history book, one of the first things I see is American imperialism. Yeah. American imperialism. They're teaching the kids how that America is an imperialist nation, conquering the nations of the world, and uh, forcing Americanism on the whole world. 
And <laughs> my friend, I just want to take the textbook and rip it up when they say something like that. America is not an imperialist nation. If you think that, you're ignorant. And uh, it, uh, it's just one of those things that's so frustrating to me. I wish they'd teach history in the public schools. I wish they'd teach about how uh, that this country actually got her war for, or went to war for independence instead of uh, promoting little Prince Harry uh, like they did last week on the news. I wish they'd talk about why we're not a one of imperialist England's uh, colonies. Amer England is an imperialist nation. It was an empire. America has never tried to build an empire. Uh, it's been a union nation of states that have united around certain beliefs. Uh, beliefs in the inalienable rights of individuals, beliefs in freedom, uh, the desire to exercise freedom of religion. And my friend, nowhere in the world is there freedom of religion like there is in the United States of America. There isn't anywhere else in the world. You go to democracies and try to knock on a door and tell people about Jesus, and you'll go to jail. Try it in Israel sometime. It's supposed to be one of the leading democracies of the world. Try and see if there's religious equality in Israel. Try it in any nation. Folks from other nations can tell you what it is, what it's like. And so, uh, it's frustrating to me, but there's two names in history that there's probably not a greater stigma than to be called. One would be, in our country, Benedict Arnold, a man that betrayed his nation. Betrayed his nation, turned on his nation, turned traitor for his own cause. And for his own good, he betrayed his people and his nation and showed a total spineless lack of courage. And if you got called when I was a kid, if you were part of a club or you were having a war, you know, we would always divide up our friends and, you know, play uh, guns, cowboys and Indians or whatever. If your team called you a Benedict Arnold, it was just like sticking a knife to your heart. And the other one's Judas. Judas. And of course, Judas is internationally known as the ultimate of the traitors. And as we read today, Judas had a tragic end. The end of Judas was positively, absolutely a tragedy, wasn't it? I mean, is anything more, does it tear at your heartstrings? To look at Judas with his 30 pieces of silver coming into the temple and saying, I don't want this money. I've betrayed innocent blood. He was innocent. An innocent man. The innocent has been condemned. This is wrong what I've done. And they said, what is it to thee? To us. Hey, take that. That's, you. That's on you, buddy. You did it. And the Bible says he went out and hanged himself. Literally took his own life because he realized what he'd done. Now there are other portions of Scripture that shed light on Judas. We know that uh, John 13 really has a good description. We'll go there here in just a minute. But we know that other places in the Gospels tell us about how that Satan entered Judas. Literally he was possessed by Satan himself uh, when he betrayed Jesus. We know the, the Old Testament of the Scripture will be in Zechariah in a little while. And, We'll look at some of the prophecies about the potter's field and the 30 pieces of silver about Judas. But my real question is, this Judas guy, how much different than us is he? Because that's really, uh, that's really the question that I want to know. Uh, if we were to boil down and to ask ourselves the question, what was the deal with Judas? What made Judas betray Jesus? We'd have a lot of answers, wouldn't we? There would be some that would say, well, you know what? It was prophesied that he would betray Jesus, and so he didn't even have a choice about it. He's just the guy that was unlucky enough that God sovereignly ordained to be the one who was going to betray Jesus. And so he was born to die, if you will. God hated him before the foundation of the world. There are people that believe that. That's nonsense. But there are people that believe that Judas didn't have a choice. He was just born to be Judas. Uh, now, God knew Judas would be born before he was born. God knew uh, who would betray him and the circumstances of it, and that Jesus Christ would fulfill prophecy by being betrayed by the one who gave him a kiss. But the reality of it is that I don't think that's a good answer. Do you? Uh, was Judas, for the entire three years or so 
of ministry that he followed the Lord Jesus? Was it his plot from the beginning to join the disciples and to get the trust of the other disciples as well as Jesus and ultimately to hand Jesus over? Well, the reality of it is that really at the time that Judas became a disciple, Jesus was nobody. Was Judas' goal from the beginning to enrich himself? We know that the scripture says that he was a thief and that he kept the bag. Remember when the alabaster box of ointment was broken on the Lord Jesus? Actually, an account of it in Matthew 26. And one of the disciples, Judas, said, Why was not this sold? And the money given to feed the poor. In other words, it was so valuable and it was just poured out on Jesus and wasted. And why, you know, why wasn't it sold and the money given to feed the poor? What good does it to anoint someone who uh, is not even dead? What is the purpose of this? This is a waste. And we see all the other disciples agreed with Jesus, but the Bible says the motive behind what Judas said was that he was a thief and that he kept the bag. It wasn't because he cared about the poor. It was because he cared about money. And uh, if he'd had the money to feed the poor, the poor maybe would have gotten a little bit, but Judas evidently would have gotten some. So there's a little bit of something to the notion that Judas wanted to enrich himself. But really, really, folks, let's think in context today, shall we? Uh, the gospel writer that we're reading from, what's his name? Matthew. Matthew. What was Matthew's occupation before he became a believer? What? Yeah, tax collector or publican. Matthew's a guy who's pretty uh, financially savvy, actually, isn't he? Matthew's a guy that thinks and understands things from a, a financial aspect because he's a money guy. He was a publican uh, before he came to follow Jesus. And, uh, you know, as he gives this account, including the 30 pieces of silver and so forth, he certainly has a perspective. Uh, but I wanted to point out you know, Matthew became a follower of Jesus. Was Matthew better off financially as a publican or a disciple? Lord, I, I, I've left everything. I'll follow you. The foxes have their holes. The birds have their nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Okay, so was Judas following Jesus in order to enrich himself? That's the question. And I'll be quite honest with you. He wouldn't be so clever if that's what he were doing, actually. Isn't it so? You know, it's kind of funny because uh, every now and again, somebody will call our church and they'll say something to me like, uh, you know, give me money. And uh, that's what you are. You're a church and churches are supposed to give me money. Pay my rent, pay my bills, uh, give me cash, whatever. I, you know, several times a week that I get calls where people want our church to give them money. And when I tell them, you know, uh, well, it's, I'm willing to look at somebody's circumstances and see if the Lord would have me to help someone. Uh, there are Bible principles for helping a brother, aren't there? But when I try to find out if they're a brother or where they go to church at, a lot of times they end up just saying to me, you're just all about money. You're just greedy. you got all that money. And, you know, you're just in it for the money. And I just think, you know, I wish you'd come visit us sometime. Amen. I wish you'd just, I wish you'd come to our church sometime. Listen, do we have plenty? Yes. Has God been good to us? Yes. <laughs> Could we be in something else if it were all about money and maybe be a little more successful in, from that perspective? And the answer is yes. Listen, I'll be honest with you, folks. I'm not in the ministry because of money. That's not what it's all about for me. Uh, God's always taking care of my needs. I consider myself uh, to be rich. That's the way I consider my. You ask, Pastor, how do you see yourself? Well, I consider myself to be rich. I have abundantly uh, everything that I need. I don't lack anything. So you're not going to hear me whining and crying about, oh, you know, all the preachers make this much, and this is how much I make. All the other churches have this much, and this is what we have. No, 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 I'm rich with regard to what I deserve, what I need, and what God's given me. I'm doing fantastic. But folks, if I were trying to be rich the way the world sees rich as different occupation, would probably be the way to go about it, not a small church in, in an obscure neighborhood in the middle of Fort Lauderdale, right? Uh, so, I don't think that was Judas's motivation either. Do you? In other words, if, if, beginning, if in the beginning Judas' motivation was, 
I need some money. So I'm going to follow Jesus and figure out if there's a way that I can turn a profit from being a disciple and I'll do whatever it takes. And then he wound up betraying him. No. What's the DNA of Judas? What made Judas? You ever ask the question, what made Judas betray Jesus? What made Judas betray Jesus? And that's a pretty good question, isn't it? Actually, somebody else have a proposition? Anybody else? Yes. Well, I'm thinking about his position as the purse holder. And I don't okay. think that was an accident. I think he intentionally got that position. Oh, for sure, yeah. So in a way, in the back of his mind or the front of his mind, maybe he was trying to enrich himself. I would say that was his weakness, for mm -hmm. sure. I would say that the, uh, the temptation to be rich. Uh, 30 pieces of silver was enough to purchase the potter's field. How rich is a guy that owns a potter's field? Well, he bought himself a job. <laughs> right? If you own a potter's field, what can you do there? Take up clay. You can take clay. What's clay? It's oh. earth. Dirt. Dirt. Uh, it's not a large portion of land. It's just, you know, it's a place you can pick up clay, dirt. Um, 30 pieces of silver isn't that much money. I mean, I'm not saying it's nothing to sneeze at, but it isn't that much. So, did money matter to Judas? Yes. Did money matter to Judas? We would say certainly say so, uh, but I would say there's a value system that Judas had, a broken value system. Yet, uh, as a proposition? Um, I was saying, I was thinking that maybe he was thinking, now how's G how is Jesus going to get out of this situation? He gets out of other situations. How will he get out of this situation? Yeah. Well, you know, he could have waited and found out. But he hanged himself before Jesus went to the cross. That's true. So if that were the case, if the case were, you know what, I'm going to force the kingdom. I've heard that message before. I'm going to force the kingdom on Jesus. Jesus, you know, he has this plan, but actually he really needs to come into power. He's God. He has the ability to call down... Uh, you know, as in this text says, he can call down what is it, a couple of legions of angels, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he can he can force things. Um, the problem with that theory is that the Bible just doesn't teach it. You know, it just isn't there. And then I would say, if that were true, wouldn't he have waited to see what Jesus would have done, and then come back and said, Jesus, sorry, I forced your hand, but you know, it was for the good. You know, it's because I was actually a promoter and supporter of you. Uh, probably not. Probably not. Yes, ma'am. He wanted to be to look good in front of the authorities, so he, you know, like. Okay, so his motive could have been popularity with the chief priests and the scribes. To go higher. Okay. The yeah. And look good. Every time he would go back and tell on Jesus, anyways. Like okay, so. Uh huh. Okay, so, yeah, he wanted to, wanted to look good. I'm, I'm sure that that was part of the motive. But there had to have been something underlying, didn't there? And so what I want to look at this morning is just the facts. I want to look at the facts, and then I would just like to draw a conclusion on the basis of the facts. There are a lot of theories. I've heard lots of messages preached about Judas, uh, explaining why Judas did what he did. But I think that there's a simple answer for it. And I just want to... Uh, ultimately, uh, look at this morning the DNA or the makeup of a traitor. Let's look at some facts that had to do uh, with with Judas. Uh, first of all, in verse 14, the Bible says in verse 14, uh, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest. So he sought out the chief priest. They did not seek him out. He sought them out. Uh, let's go back to Psalm real quickly. Let's just look at some prophecy about Judas, shall we? Psalm 44, and then we'll be in Psalm 55 after that if you want to just kind of be ready uh, for, for turning ahead. Uh, Psalm chapter 40. Did I say 44? I meant to say 41. I hope I said Psalm 41. And we will see a prophecy of Judas. In verse 9... Here's one of the prophecies specifically about him. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, 
hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, we understand that there, for David, there could be, uh, there certainly could have been times when he would have said, the person that ate my bread is turned against me. That would be true for him, but actually, David understood, if you study the Psalms, he understood many times that he was not speaking of himself, he was speaking of the Lord. When he said, for instance, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the uh, disciples said, was, was he talking about himself or was he talking about some other? In other words, no, he, David wasn't calling himself the Lord uh, in, that, in that instance. Let's go to Psalm 55 and just look at it. I just want to look at the prophecies about Judas because certainly the Scripture does prophesy that this is the way that Jesus Christ would be betrayed. And Jesus explains that he's going to be betrayed before it happens as well. Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14. The Bible says in verse 12, For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it, neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. Let's go to Zechariah, shall we? Uh, Zechariah, right near the end of your Bible, and not right near the end of your Old Testament, I mean to say, Zechariah, and uh, let's find there, uh, chapter, I believe it's 11. Zechariah chapter 11. Let's look down and find uh, verses 10 through 13. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price... 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Well, there is certainly a prophecy here that Jesus well understood. Now think about this in terms, uh, if you'll go back to Matthew chapter 27, think of this in terms of the priest, if you will, please after Judas had said, we read in verse 4, I sinned and that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, this is the chief priest, what is that to us? See thou to that. Verse 6, And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. Now, certainly influence, certainly uh, money, had a little bit of a bearing. And we know that that Judas cared about money. He was a thief, the Bible said, so he coveted. There was certainly a covetous aspect to, to Judas, but when Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, all of a sudden the money didn't have value to him, did it? He threw it down, and uh, they said, it's yours, take it. And he turned and he walked out and left it there and left them with the problem of what to do with it. And they fulfilled prophecy. Now, isn't this foolish? In so many ways, the chief priests themselves were used for, to fulfill prophecy. And they went out and bought the potter's field. And we have today potter's field where people who cannot afford a burial are actually buried. He threw it down and it was called, uh, of course, the place of blood. And so these individuals fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 11. And it, they took, the verse 9, the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, and whom they of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. And so we see Judas fulfills prophecy uh, and the chief priest fulfills prophecy. But the question we have is what made Judas do what Judas did? Either it's true that he was just a robot born for this purpose, reluctant to perform it, but God hated him from the foundation of the world and he just had to be uh, the one who Satan entered. Or he had a motive. And he was a willing participant in what he did. Now friend, it's contrary to the nature of God. It's contrary to the nature of God. 
to judge the righteous. Or to judge someone who has no choice, has no will. That's a contradiction of the Scripture. Judas had a choice about what he did. He chose to do what he did. And the question is, what motivated Judas? Well, let's look, look at the man just a little bit more. We go to John chapter 13. I'd like to look at John's account. So just over in the Gospels, a, a couple of pages to John and uh, chapter 13. What's the DNA of a traitor? What, what makes somebody do what Judas did? What is he thinking? Uh, in verse 2, the Bible says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Okay, now there's a little clue, isn't there? In other words, this isn't something that up until this point has been part of Judas' plot. We see from verse 2 of John chapter 13 that the notion to do what he did happened when Satan put it in his heart to do it. Right? So we could, uh, first of all this morning, say, the devil told me to do it. Couldn't we about Judas? Is that what the Bible says? The devil told him to. Well, let me ask you a practical question. Uh, has the devil ever told you to do something? Yeah. Huh. Boy, y'all a bunch of devilish people. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Do you always do what the devil says? No. no. Okay, so we could say about Judas, first of all, the devil told me to do it, but we couldn't say about Judas, the devil made me do it. Remember what James said? Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. Well, we're not saying that God tempted uh, Judas, although that is, that is the argument from a God sovereignly made Judas do this and he had no choice about it. God tempted me. God made me do it. Uh, don't say you're tempted of God. But then the next part of the verse in James says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Okay, so let's add a little information here. Could we please? Would this be biblically, scripturally accurate to say God didn't make him do it, the devil didn't make him do it, but the devil told him to do it, and he was tempted by his own lust. We could say that's accurate, couldn't we? The devil told him to do it, and he was tempted by his own lust or by his own flesh. In other words, what Judas did, he did because he had a desire to do. It's what he wanted to do. The devil said, betray Jesus. And Judas said, I want to. Now that seems sinister. That seems evil. That seems crooked. That's what happened. The devil said, betray Jesus. And Judas said, yes, I will. I'll do it. But the question is, why did Judas wish to? Why did he want to betray Jesus? You know, right in that passage of Scripture we read in John 26 is a famous portion of Scripture that every time I preach through Matthew, I feel obligated to mention. All right, not preach a message about necessarily, but at least mention because of what Jesus said. Do you remember what Jesus said about the woman who broke the alabaster box on Jesus and the anointing for a bear? What did he say about that woman? What? Everywhere the gospel is preached, she's mentioned. Everywhere the gospel is preached, she'll be remembered. And I just want to take a moment on Memorial Day weekend and remember the lady that broke the alabaster box on the feet of the Lord Jesus. She's famous for what she did for the Lord Jesus when she could do it. And she was a great example for that. And uh, <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful account. It's appropriate for us to remember that, isn't it? In the same passage of Scripture, I try never to preach through the Gospel and not mention that lady because Jesus said she'd be mentioned. It isn't as though she's dependent on me for the mention. She's in the Scripture. But where the Gospel's preached, she ought to be mentioned. She has an honorable mention. Was Judas trying to be famous? I mean, that's kind of the, the, what Sophie said a little bit. Was, uh, well, he wanted to be you know, somebody with the people there. Uh, maybe he wanted 
to be, to be famous. I'm certain there was that appeal. It is certain that Judas was dealing with the appeal of the lust of his flesh. Isn't it so? In other words, he certainly was drawn by fleshly loss, a fleshly appetite. You could say it's 30 pieces of silver. Probably wasn't just that. You could say it's because he's a thief and he cared about that. You could say it was about recognition. It's probably a little bit of all those things. But we know that those things had no value for him after he had realized that the innocent one had been condemned. He threw the money down and fulfilled the prophecy and walked out. So my question is, was he looking for his minute of fame? I almost hate to mention this because it's so tragically evident in our society today that people for five minutes of fame are willing to do the most despicable things. Isn't it true? What, why, are we, why do we have a generation that calls themselves the shooting generation? Is it because they've been born in an era where there are firearms? There have been firearms for a long time. Before that, there were knives and swords and rocks. That isn't why. We have a generation of people that, for the fame of it, would take a life. I mean, as, as nuts as that is. By the way, kudos uh, to that young man, that teacher, uh, that saved those lives in Indiana. What a, what a courageous man. What an example of what a leader ought to be. That guy that, uh, when the kid came in the classroom shooting, just took the kid out. Just right there. And it didn't kill the kid. Took four shots himself, but saved, it, but saved everybody's lives. Wow. And what a man that was. You know, is I, we need to import some guys from Indiana, I think, into our schools here in Florida for teachers because we, we certainly have some, I don't want to say it's about all of our teachers, but certainly our law enforcement lacks courage. And I, I, I hate to say that, it's just the truth of it. We need courage. We need men with courage. And we ought to say something about guys that have courage and commend them for it. That man was a man, and he had courage, and so he gets his men out of fame too, I guess. If you will, the reality of it though is, was Judas trying for five minutes of fame? Possibly. I mean, could I, could I, could I be famous as the guy that betrayed the Lord Jesus? Could that have been his motivation? I, I could be the most hated man in the world. There are some sick, twisted people, and I'm not going to say that. That's impossible, but that really wasn't Judas's mantra. It wasn't the way he went. Let's let me let me specifically see if I could debunk that for a second. Who was the most popular of the disciples? Judas. Well, jo John felt like he was the most loved, but no, Judas was the most popular of the disciples. Actually, when Judas said something like, "Why was not this money sold?" and the uh, or why was not this sold? The money given to feed the poor. All the disciples went, yeah. What he said. Who was the guy that kept the bag for the disciples? Who was the most trusted of the disciples? Judas was. He was the guy that had the most trust. I do not think that it would be consistent with what we know about Judas to say that he wanted to be known as the most evil person in the world forever. That he wanted to be known as the ultimate of the traitors. The one who betrayed the Son of God with a kiss. I don't think that's what, how he wanted to go down. Certainly, after he succeeded in what he tried to do, he certainly didn't seem uh, to want to enjoy his fame, did he? No. So, we really, so far today, we've only gotten about one thing that we can say for certain the Bible says about Judas that actually gives us an insight into why he did what he did. And the one thing that we have is that we know the Satan, that Satan told him to and that he wanted to. Basically, on the authority of the Scripture, we know that Satan said, hey, betray Jesus. That played right into God's hand, didn't it? Satan played right into God's hand. And that Judas wanted to betray Jesus, and that also played right into God's hand because that's what Jesus came to die to do, is to die. Okay, John 13 is where Jesus begins to tell his disciples that he is going to be betrayed. But in verse 2, the Bible says he was put into Judas Iscariot's heart to betray him. Then we have where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, and uh, then following uh, that, that scenario where Jesus... Uh, washed the feet of the disciples. 
let's go down to uh, chapter uh, chapter 13. Let's look at verse 18. Jesus said, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Of course, we saw that in, in Psalm today, didn't we? Verse 19, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Jesus said, I'm just telling you ahead of time so that you'll know that it's me. Uh, verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Verse 21, When Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now can you imagine the atmosphere here? Here is a close-knit group of individuals that really are... It's that, those twelve, there are other disciples of Jesus. There are many followers of Jesus, multitudes that believed in Jesus. But it's these twelve and Jesus. And when you've got a small group like that, it's a toxic environment when there's a traitor in the middle of it, isn't it? I mean, that should be an intimate group, a place of trust. And now Jesus is visibly, John says, troubled in his spirit. And he said, one of you is going to betray me. And I can right here just imagine, you know, the looking around. And so John is here, if you can imagine this scenario, John is nearest to Jesus. He's leaning against Jesus' breast. And the Bible says indicates that he's close enough to Jesus that he's able to ask Jesus a question privately. So one of the other disciples told John, ask Jesus who it is. In verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned him. You see it? Beckoned to him. He didn't say it. He said, ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? John said, Lord, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. And then notice verse 28. This is astonishing. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, by those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So, we see indicated here that Judas, you know, go give something to the poor, Judas was the guy that took care of that. Or, if you needed to go get something, hey Judas, go get some food for the, go take care of something for the feast. But the question that was asked, at least two people are aware of the question, right? Peter said, and John said, Jesus, who is it? And Jesus said, it's the one that I dip the sop and give to. He dipped the sop, and he gave it to Judas, and he said, that thou doest do quickly. And Judas took off, and everybody said, oh, he's going to go feed the poor, or he's going to go buy something for the feast. Literally, Judas had such a stellar reputation he had, he had presented himself in such a way to the disciples that Jesus saying, that's the guy that's going to betray me. At least, I, I think all of them heard what Jesus said here. But at least, Peter knew what Jesus was talking about and John knew what Jesus was talking about. Isn't it so from the text? Isn't that as plain as the nose on your face? If you're looking in a mirror anyway. I can see my nose. Yeah, it's getting longer. Okay, uh, can't you tell? Can't you see it from the scripture? Sure, it's there, isn't it? And yet the Bible says whoosh, they didn't catch it at all. They had no idea that he was talking about the one that would betray Jesus. They just didn't think Judas would do that. I want to stop here and remind you of something. It's possible... It's possible for us to think more highly of people than we do Jesus. And unfortunately, tragically, the disciples actually did. As tragic as it is, when Judas said, we should have sold this and fed the poor, people said, yeah, Jesus, 
you shouldn't let that lady waste that on you. And actually, in their estimation, Judas was the more right or righteous than Jesus himself. Friend, listen to me now. Listen, will you please? There are many instances in life where we do this very same thing that the disciples did. We're ready to jump on somebody's bandwagon when he's actually against God. Or he's actually disagreeing with God. It's incredible to me how oftentimes somebody will have the audacity to say that something that Jesus said, you know, I just don't understand sometimes judgment. I just don't understand, you know, how God could be a God of love and a God of judgment. Come back with that? Seriously? You don't understand how God could be loving and judge? Seriously? My friend, you realize what you're actually implying? You're implying that somehow you're more loving than God if you don't understand how a loving God could judge. You're implying that somehow you're more righteous than God, who's the only one who's ever sinned and had His righteous Son die for your sin. And sometimes we can just latch on to or attach ourselves to a notion that accuses God and somehow puts us in a really lovely light but makes God look like He's not so good. And here when Jesus is exposing the one who betrayed Him, they had such a high view of Judas that they just couldn't believe it. They just didn't believe it. Have you ever had somebody tell you something plainly and it's just like you just, it just kind of went right over your head just because you just would have never considered that it could possibly be true? And then later on you found out he's true and you realize that person told me that. I can think of those instances in my life where I just, just didn't believe it. Just, I didn't think that person would do that. I don't know what you're saying, but you know you, you can't be serious. They wouldn't do that. They couldn't do that. And oftentimes we have such a high view of someone. Okay, but that still doesn't answer our question about Judas. We know that Satan told him to. We know that he agreed to it. We know that Satan entered him and he went out to do what he'd agreed to. But the question is, how could he ever have gotten to this place? I want to remind you about some things with Judas. How long had Judas been a disciple of the Lord Jesus? At least three years, right? Could we say as long as the other disciples? What were his experiences? Miracles. Now let's go through Matthew. We start by being introduced to Jesus. He is born of a seed or of a line of individuals that's traced through Joseph, actually. And uh, we see that he's also traced through Mary. Jesus is born of a virgin. Joseph would have been that line that was rejected uh, from being king, but he would have been a hereditary rightful king of Israel. But Jesus was born of a virgin. And in, in that virgin line were some individuals like Tamar, like Rahab, uh, like Ruth, uh, individuals that if you were to examine them, you'd say, that's a little bit of a shady background for the perfect Son of God to be a descendant of that line. And yet, even including Joseph himself, we see the thing that's always impressed God has not been the righteousness of a person. It's just simply been that a person loves Him. And so we see wonderful examples. And the reality of it is, actually, friend, for you and I who are sinners, Rahab is relatable. Tamar is relatable. Ruth is relatable. So It's a wonderful thing when somebody who doesn't belong gets in simply because they love God and God loves them. And we see the kind of people God uses in the first part of Matthew. Uh, not, not perfect people, not even righteous people, but God uses sinners. And it's a real encouraging thing to me that God can use a sinner. Does that make you feel good to know that God can use a sinner? I don't feel good about sin, but I feel good about God. And it certainly does that for me. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 3 and 4, we see an introduction to John the Baptist and his ministry, and then Jesus gets filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapters 4 through 6 is where we really get introduced to guys like Judas because that's when Jesus called his disciples and began to teach them. Actually, chapters 4 through 7 of Matthew. And Jesus begins to give His disciples literally the benefits or the orientation for the discipleship ministry. In chapter 10, Jesus sends out His disciples, or He gives them power over to cast out devils, 
uh, to uh, power over sicknesses, uh, power to heal. And he gives his disciples powers and sends them out in groups of two. And then he preaches the gospel. And then from there forward, we see a series of Jesus doing miracles that prove that he's God, of, of showing in the face of the unbelieving Pharisees and scribes and their challenges, of him giving answers and teaching parables where spiritual truth is hidden from the unbelievers, but spiritual truth is understood by the believers, or a parable is given and they go away and the, and the Pharisees and the scribes that don't want to believe, they, they go away and they, they don't understand. And then the disciples come and say, Jesus, we didn't understand what you said either. Why do you speak to them in parables? And then Jesus would give them the hidden meaning. Unto you it's given to know the things of the kingdom of God. And Judas was one of those guys. He was an insider in all of this. He saw the miracles. He saw the things that Jesus did that proved that he was God. And in every one of those instances of Jesus doing things that proved he is God, we saw that there are two responses. Either people responded by saying, I believe, or people responded by saying, I don't believe. But one of the things that we drew a conclusion of was that what you see and what God has done has nothing to do with what you believe. That's a choice. Belief has always been a choice, hasn't it? Listen, Jesus fed the 5,000. When He fed the 5,000, some people believed. Other people ate the bread and didn't believe. The facts have nothing to do with what you believe. And can I say to you, my friend, that Judas is here another example of the same. Judas here is an example of an individual who had more access to truth than perhaps anyone in history has ever had. He even was an insider to things that the other disciples didn't know. Jesus said, somebody's going to betray me, and Judas knew who it was. And he was able to sit there and say, Lord, is it I? Knowing that the other disciples would not even believe that it could be him because he built such a reputation for himself. That's slick, isn't it? We could say Judas is a slickster. And we could say that he was able to sell himself. But the question that we still have is why? <coughs> Is it okay if I answer your question without answering it? You yes. say, not really, Pastor. Well, I'm going to. You, this morning, either completely understand and can relate to Judas, or you never will. Listen to me. This morning, and you need to get this, this is so important. You either will completely understand and relate to Judas, or you never will. If you're the kind of person that when Jesus does a miracle that only God could do, your conclusion that you draw is, He must be God. I'm going to believe in Him. Put my trust in Him. You'll never understand Judas. Do you hear me this morning? If you expect this morning to be a believer and understand unbelief, my friend, I'm sorry, you can't. Sometime for your amusement, read the judgment that God meets out upon unbelievers. Read the revelation of what is going to ultimately happen to those individuals who reject Jesus as their Savior and shake their fist at God and say, God, under no circumstance will I bow. And while they're saying it, they're gazing into heaven where God is sitting on His throne, very evidently God, and they still will not bow. You know, I'll say uncle if you get me down and you cause me enough pain and I realize, okay, the way out of pain is to say uncle, I'll bow. I know some people that won't. <coughs> I know some people will say you have to kill me because I'll never, I'll never submit to you. Well, they exist, don't they? They exist. You know what Judas had a case of? He had a bad case of, I will not believe. 
And I can tell you that, and you'd say, Pastor, I don't understand it. No, because you believe. Listen, when Jesus proves He's God, you say, well, good enough. You know why you believe? <laughs> I'm not diminishing your reason at all, but I'll tell you why, because you want to. It's your choice. It's a choice or a decision of your will, and you've made the choice. And my friend, once you've believed in God, the truth of the matter is, is that God doesn't have a far stretch to take you to the next step of believing anything else. Listen, if you believe Jesus is God, my friend, you can believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And if you believe that Jesus is God, you can believe that He's the only way for eternal. You can believe everything about Jesus once you believe He's God. You know Judah's problem? He didn't believe anything about Jesus. And it had nothing to do with the facts. See, the facts that Judas held were the same as the facts every other disciple held. But he held them in unbelief versus in belief. See, John believed in God. Believed the promise of God. And when he saw Jesus, he said, that's the one. That's the message of John the Baptist, wasn't it? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the one that I tell you, he's the one that I'm telling you about. And when, when he pointed and said, that's him, and the Holy Ghost came on Jesus and sat on Him, and God said from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days and didn't eat or drink and survived uh, the temptation in the wilderness and began His earthly ministry. Everything Jesus did supported what they believed. It proved it. Even the betrayal of Judas helps me to believe because of what the Scripture prophesied about Judas. Judas, Jesus said, I have to be betrayed i got to fulfill the prophecy of the Scripture. And John writes about it and says, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the betrayal of Jesus Christ, and Judas is the guy that God used to do it. And Matthew writes an account, the Gospels give an account of Judas fulfilling the prophecy of the Scripture and betraying Jesus, and it helped them believe because they believed. There was one disciple who did not believe. And my friend, nothing Jesus did helped him. Nothing Jesus did helped him. You say, Pastor, he knew the truth. You know, truth is nothing more than facts. But it has nothing to do with what you believe. My friend, there are people that know there's a God. They don't believe in Jesus. There are people that know that Jesus is God, but they don't trust Him as their Savior. You say, Pastor, why is that? If I were an unbeliever, perhaps I could tell you. But I'm not. I don't understand why Judas would have access to the Son of God and be willing to betray Him. <coughs> but I'll warn you this morning, if you do, there's something about you that needs to change. You need to do like every one of us that were once in unbelief, did, you need to come to a place of going from unbelief to belief in Jesus. Your problem isn't facts. That wasn't Judas' problem. Your problem isn't that you don't have enough or you have too much. We can point at problem after problem and reason after reason for why Judas did what he did. And my friend, there is no good reason for Judas to betray Jesus. Do we really think we could come up with one? The reason Judas betrayed Jesus is because he made a choice of unbelief. The same as anyone else. Just like anyone else. You hear this morning, you've never put your faith in Jesus. Never trusted the work of the cross the sacrifice uh, Jesus made for your sin, you've never trusted that alone for your salvation, my friend, it's not because you cannot. It really comes down to a choice. See, a lot of times, because of the way we use the term faith and the way we use the term belief, we think of it in terms of response to what's natural in us. Don't we? But believing actually isn't something that happens to you. Believing is something that you make a choice to do. <laughs> I 
I'm afraid of a lot of things, and if you follow me around and watch me, you might have the impression that I'm not. For instance, I'm definitely afraid of heights. I'm very afraid of heights. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane uh, Charlie and Hurricane uh, Ivan, when I was in seminary, you know what I did to pay for seminary? I climbed to the top of 90-foot bull pines and limbed them down, roped them down from the top. You ever been on the top of a 90-foot tree? It's like a pole. You ever done that? You know what it's like being on top of a pole? It feels like you move from this end of the room to that end of the room every time there's a breeze. And you're on a compromise. It's terrifying. I'm deathly afraid of it. But, you know something? I believe I could climb to the top of the top highest tree and uh, with a chainsaw, limit and cut it and uh, rope it down. I have full faith that I could do that. You know why I believe that? Because I saw somebody do it and I said I could do that. And then I did it. I still don't like heights. But if you ask the question, could you climb the top of a tree? The answer is yes, I could. Give me a set of spurs and some rope and I'll do it. Doesn't mean I'll like it. Doesn't mean I'll enjoy it. But I can do it. There are some people that could do it but can't. And the reason is they say, I wouldn't do that. A lot of things I, I just am afraid to do. I've done. I've jumped out of an airplane before. And uh, I think I enjoyed it. Uh, but I was afraid to do it. I thought, you know, the sun is in a bucket list. You know, jump out of an airplane and see if it kills you. Uh, things you got to do when you're young. And uh, done that before. You say, Pastor, could you jump out of an airplane? Yes, I could. Now, there are some things I have not done in life that I'm confident I could as well. But I will not do because I don't need to or whatever reason is. But the reality of it is, how do I know that I can do something? <coughs> well, first of all, it has to be possible, right? But secondly, I have to act on what I know. Put my faith in it. I believe it. Now, I know that's a weak illustration of faith, but faith is a choice. There's a guy that could say, I know I could go to the top of a tree, but he doesn't really know it unless he's done it. He doesn't really know if he could or not. There are things you think you could do, and they're all theory, and you don't really know until you've done something about it. And that's a choice. Now, we're not playing silly games of trying to believe. We're making a choice of belief. We take the facts. Here are some facts for you. I know I'm over time this morning, but here are some facts for you. We're here. I'm not trying to be overly simplistic, but the fact that you exist is an evidence that you were made. And the fact that the world exists, the Bible says, is an evidence that it was made. It's not a far stretch to say God is a creator. Whereas there are facts that show us that there's a God. And we can look at creation and know there's a God. The manner in which we are made, we're made to worship God. Man naturally worships something. We're made that way. You can corrupt it and worship the wrong thing. But actually, when you tell a child that there's a God and that we were made to worship a God, a child happily worships God. Because that's just how we're made. That's a fact. We're sinners. And the only way to really understand where sin came from is go to the Word of God and read about the origin of sin in Genesis and realize that it happened because of the sin curse that happened when man sinned. And there's a promise of a Savior and my friend, history corroborates. Secular history corroborates what the inspired history, which is the Word of God, tells us. And that's that Jesus was God. Individuals like Josephus give an account of a man that did miracles that no man could explain. And he was not merely a magician, but he did things that only God could do. And even though Josephus himself was not a believer, the facts of what Jesus did were undeniable. The Pharisees sought reason to destroy Jesus, and they sought ways to destroy Jesus in spite of the facts. They knew that the people believed He was God because they believed He was God, but they didn't put their faith in Him. See, a lot of times we think that facts make us believe or don't make us believe, but my friend... Facts have got nothing to do with it ultimately. We said this earlier, and I'll say it again. If you make a determination that you believe something or don't believe something, there will be no convincing you. 
Because facts have nothing to do with it. Has someone ever believed something about you that was untrue? You ever had somebody believe something about you that was untrue, and you finally realized, I can't convince them otherwise, because they believe what they want to believe about me, and nothing I say, or nothing that, that I show them or prove to them, proves anything because they want to believe it about me. And my friend, I will say to you this morning, as, as precisely as I possibly can, that you believe what you want to. Facts are the facts. Facts being what they are. Jesus was God, and Judas knew it. But he didn't believe in Jesus. And that's incredible, isn't it? The other disciples did, but Judas didn't. And so Judas betrayed, the Jesus, betrayed Jesus, not for the 30 pieces of silver, not for the fame, <coughs> not because he was manipulated by the devil, not because he was foreordained before he was born that he would be the one. No, Judas betrayed Jesus because he did not believe. And my friend, that's the DNA of a traitor. I believe. How about you? If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Facts don't have anything to do with it. Belief. Whether or not you'll receive Jesus. I'm amazed at how an unbeliever can levy accusations against God, who is actually the one whom they'll have to defend themselves to. As though they're God's judge, they judge Him, but they will stand before Him and be judged. And it's as backward as it can be. Instead of it being, God, why should I, why should I have fellowship with you? Why should I forgive your sin? Their answer is, God, how can you? And it's all backward, and it's all because they don't believe. I can't completely relate to it. I know it's a fact. I don't know why anyone would reject Jesus for their Savior when He loves you so much that He died on the cross and became your sin. When He's God's perfect Son, why would anyone turn down the free gift of eternal life? My friend, logic, you won't find it. Reason isn't there. But unbelief being what it is, that's why. Because you make a choice of unbelief. How about it this morning? Father, I pray that You would help us this morning to understand that there will one day be a moment or a time when our belief is something that we are confirmed within. It's too late today for Judas. It's too late for Judas today to say, I made a mistake, I did the wrong thing, I betrayed innocent blood, and to turn. Judas realized on that day that he threw the 30 pieces of silver that he had betrayed the Son of God. And yet, he still did not believe. And today, he's still in torment. God, help us not to be able to relate to Judas. Help us not to be able to understand unbelief simply because we have believed. Father, I pray that there be an individual in this room this morning that has not placed their faith and trust in Jesus. That, God, they would recognize what a dangerous, perilous game they're playing with rebellion and with unbelief. That they'd make a choice. God, it has nothing to do with the facts. Your Holy Spirit will convince them of truth if they'll hear it. And yet, God, they still will not believe. <coughs> I pray that you would help them to realize that, that they can turn, they can make a decision, that they will believe, that they will, that they will receive Jesus as their Savior. God, I pray for ourselves as Christians when we see tendencies and characteristics to be Judas-like. Or like the disciples when we looked at Judas and saw the, see the good in him when actually he was campaigning to look better than Jesus. Lord, help us to be also careful. I pray that you bless and move in the invitation now. We're going to have a time of invitation in our service this morning. Before we finish our prayer, I want to ask everyone just for a moment to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And the reason for this is that it's so important for every person to have a moment of privacy. And I'd just like to ask one simple question in our invitation this morning, and our time will be done. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, and you would have to say, Pastor, you know something? I can't say that I'm a believer. I can't say that I've received Jesus. Matter of fact, I can actually kind of understand a little bit about Judas. 
because of unbelief. And God's convicted me about that today. The Holy Spirit has spoken to me. And I realize I need to trust Jesus as my Savior. Pastor, would you pray for me? Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But would you pray for me? I know that I need to receive Jesus as my Savior. You just slip your hand up just real quick. Just slip it up slip it right back down. Okay, second question this morning, the invitation. This would be between you and the Lord. I wouldn't call you out or embarrass you. But Pastor, I, sometimes when I look at a man like Judas, I realize I'm more prone to think more highly of him and that I would be more like the disciples in thinking highly of him and thinking that Judas, Jesus is even wrong to call him a traitor. And yet I see this morning that Jesus is always right. And sometimes I'm wrong in the way I look at things. God showed me that this morning. Pastor, would you pray for me? I, think I want God to work on that in my heart. I want to be able to just believe God that He's good and just trust Him. God's dealing with me about that matter. Would you Would you just pray for me? Don't call me out or embarrass me. Pray for me. Slip your hand up real quickly. Just slip it right back down. God, I just thank You for those who have uh, shared these truths and the invitation this morning. I ask that you do a work in their hearts and their lives. Lord, help us to be able to understand a traitor, Lord, in a way that we cannot relate to, but it's simply unbelief. And help us to, God, understand the importance of our believing Jesus. And we ask it in His name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your attention this morning. You're dismissed.